and welcome into another edition of Nightcast. Here, of course, I am Kyle Nash, the student of the game. I, you may have noticed by now I am not Jeff Sharon once again. He is still on assignment, but we wish him and everyone around him the best. Um, hold on a second. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Night Shift. Of course, I am Kyle Nash, the student of the game. You may have noticed by now that I'm not Jeff Sharon. He is still on assignment for the moment. We hope all that is going well for him. I'm in here with the heavy hitters, Bryson Turner, Nick Porcelli here to bring down some of the, I mean, it's not springtime action yet. Do we call it pre-spring? Is Christmas pre-spring? All these things get very confusing. Of course, uh, on the horizon, we'll be talking more about the Gasparilla Bowl next week as we head into that. That'll be, we'll probably be recording that the night before, very close to it. So uh, fans on that horrific drive from Orlando to uh, Raymond James uh, will have something to deal with that trash. But enough about that. Let's get into it, of course. Uh, guys, listen, I want to open up here. I, I, we're going to do a real quick football thing because football is great and all of that stuff. But uh, I, I was told that uh, my services for therapy for UCF fans would be necessary when yep. it came to the failing of Bryson McCall. Now, there was a whole thing made about it on the socials. Um, he was battling with North Carolina State, and the scuttlebutt, I guess, was, well, hey, he went to North Carolina State, and it wasn't all that, but he went to UCF, and oh, my God, it was lit, as the kids say, right? So I say all the above to say he ended up going to North Carolina State anyway. Now, Nick, I'm, I'll throw this one to you. What? Well, I'll add this. Of course, UCF social media communities responded with the cool, collected, and mature response that you thought that they would probably not. But um, Nick, uh, what 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 therapy should I provide here? What do you think are the burning questions surrounding that? What happens now? What are we going to do? That's because now everyone thinks we've hit a dead end. There's no hope in sight. We're screwed at the quarterback position. Cancel the program. <laughs> I mean, first of all, I, 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 l let me put it this way. Darren Henshaw, what he did with one John Rice Plumley and his throwing motion in just one offseason was amazing. Imagine what he can do with a Timmy McLean, who has had some time under his belt uh, in this offense now, who started a number of games and got good experience doing it, right? And, and all of that, another offseason – with Darren Hinshaw, we'll make Timmy McLean a better player. Uh, and we, we won't even bring up, bring up uh, Dylan Risk or Rizik or however we're saying it this week. But the punchline is, is let's let's give let's give Coach Hinshaw a chance to develop the two quarterbacks in house. I think that's a worthy question. Um, and Elo's not on here to to tell me, well, the quarterback is not in the room right now, and he may still not be to to his would be point. But here's the thing about Grayson McCall, and I've seen him play in two different Cure Bowls personally. So I can speak to this a little bit. I followed him some for his time as a Chanticleer with Coastal Carolina. By the way, I mentioned the Cure Bowl. You're going to see that at FBC Mortgage Stadium here this weekend as UCF is now hosting bowl games. So there's that to think about. But all the above being said, Grayson McCall is a dude who I feel like needs the ball in his hands pretty much at all times. He's not John Rice Plumley fast. And he's a guy that that is is very chaotic. I I don't want to call him Mackenzie Milton per se because Mackenzie Milton was chaotic, but the chaos always seemed to work except for the one single time I can think of that it didn't. We don't need to bring that up because that was a very horrific injury. But Grayson McCall has that kind of gunslinger, you know, freelance kind of style. He's not necessarily a running quarterback that's leading a run first team. So for my money, while I'm sure it would have been nice, I never really thought McCall was a fit. Does that make sense, guys? I mean, Bryson, you've talked a lot about some of the way Timmy McLean freelances and how it didn't look right. I know McCall has more experience, but it kind of fits in what you've talked about during the season with what you saw from Timmy McLean when he was freelancing. Hero ball is is Grayson McCall's middle name, and I didn't even mean to rhyme there, but I, I don't know if you guys have anything else to throw in as far as that, um, uh, and, and there's also a number of linemen movement as well. 
Um, by the way, Lokahi Paoli mentioned to the USA Today uh, All-Big 12 team. So there's that. Um, but, yeah. yeah. What's that? Congrats to him. Yeah, yeah congrats. I, I was, I'm going to say, as, as far as um, Hero Ball, the way that I feel like that the best way I can describe Hero Ball is that it is making a – gut kind of a go with your gut decision where yes there might be a con and it might go badly but (laughs) you're still going to do it anyway because you think it's the way that that's what your best chance to succeed now when when hero ball works it's awesome it's just like (laughs) right it's just like with play call it's just like with play calling when it works then you're hailed as a genius when it doesn't you're looked at as an idiot (laughs) <laughs> so, um, it's basically it, so the the thing with Timmy McLean is I think that he that he can he has the athleticism to make it work. The problem is is that it hasn't worked more often than it has. I mean, we've seen a couple of really really good plays from Timmy McLean, and I, that made me very. That's always one of those plays where just when we thought it it you it couldn't get worse, you did that and totally redeemed yourself, but. The punchline being is I think working with Hinshaw for a more for more time can definitely, what's the word, curb those tendencies to or at least give him more resources and give him more I like I things to look for when in those types of situations. Now, by the same token, transfer portal to period is not over yet. So right. we there and there's still plenty of court of quarterbacks that are still in the transfer po- transfer portal I was looking I think that's the main thing you you tell fans who are all distraught about McCall like granted you bring up the interesting point of what would Darren Hinshaw do with a Grayson McCall in a single uh off season maybe that'll work maybe it won't at least Hinshaw had kind of a what's his word warming up period um, to to kind of get used to um, John Rice Plumley, but I I'll put it this way: that's an interesting rift, and and I think you make the point that makes it most easy uh, that fans need to accept. Not only are there other quarterbacks, you may find one that's a better fit long term, even than Grayson McCall, because he was also a one year rental. I, for me, I mean, like it had been nice. I'd have had fun talking to the kid again, but I don't know. This one didn't damage my soul like it did to the rest of the uh, Twitter fanhood. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 first of all, UCF fans, I love you guys to death because I'm one of you. But be honest, how many of you actually knew who Grayson McCall was before there was a possibility that he was going to transfer here? Like, be honest. I'm going to guess not. not Grayson, you're a media member. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, you fair. But let's, but like, listen, like to all the people being like, this is the end of the world. We'll find a way. We always find a way. Okay. Like. I believe that if McCl- Timmy McClain never got into a game like as a starter last year, like if JRP never got injured, then people will be fine because they'd just be like, yeah, he'll be the starter because, yeah, sure. He should no, be complaining about JRP because they never saw the alternative. That's what would have happened. Yeah. Like, look, you, yeah, he, yeah, he had mistakes, but that's why he was the backup. He wasn't supposed to play, but he also showed why he could be a starter in the future. He's showed flashes of brilliance. He just needs time to iron out the wrinkles. And now he's going to get that in the off season. I was impressed by a lot of the things Timmy McLean did. That's a great point, Nick. Yeah, yeah, I, I, he, I, yeah he's still young. He still he still needs some things to develop. So did John Rice Plumley, and he showed that. And like you mentioned, looks like he, he ironed out those wrinkles in the off season with Darren Henshaw. So maybe, so maybe now the same thing's going to happen. So like, just calm down. Like this isn't the worst worst thing in the world. It's it's not like we were going to get like a Heisman Trophy worthy quarterback coming in like by, right. by that same token though this this also means that dylan risk is also going to be getting a uh, another off season of development with tim mcclain which could provide a very good interesting quarterback competition i remember that i still remember in the preseason when talking to coach Hinshaw about the quarterback situation that the, that those that JRP and then McLean and Ritz Ritz were both he was both very impressed by in the course of the in the course of the preseason, which is why things shook out the way that they did. So 
I think that that we could, even if Timmy isn't the answer, I think Riss, Riss is also making a, a much of progress as well. And if he shows out this pre this preseason, then it, it, the point is it's going to be a competition. If, yeah. if even if we don't get a quarterback from the transfer portal, I don't think it's just going to be immediately Timmy McLean. He is obviously is the odds on favor. That either, he, but Riss has got a chance. He really does have a shot. Exactly, but. Again, by the same token, we still have a week of this kind of transfer portal signing period before the signing before signing day happens on December twentieth, I believe. So we still have plenty of time to go after somebody transfer portal. Uh, heck, I mean, Florida native Jordan McLeod from drink from James Madison. James Madison is still there. That's one name off the top of my head. I saw like yeah. Texas backup going the port. It's, we don't need to go down. The we don't need to go down point, that right. Point is, point is, is that there, uh, my, my, I, I say that to say is there's a lot of names still in the transfer portal, and there's yeah, obviously that's why plenty I say more don't go down the list. There's that many. There's, there's plenty more options for UCF <laughs> to to look through. There's there's plenty of fish in the sea. We'll yeah, we'll right. Fine. I mean, the, the the case and the point. There's plenty of transfers. Um, Timmy McLean has another off season. Um, to get better and Darren Henshaw may get less risk and more reward from Dylan. Anyways, oh, it's your boy. fault for wanting to read off the quarterbacks. I had more time to think of the dad joke. Anyways, it I, be an episode without one, honestly, I went full John Cena on you, Bryson, and I blame you anyways. Um, moving on with that, we're talking all this stuff about transfers. I want, want to touch a little bit on the recent NCAA ruling Bryson, kind of walk me through that. It's it's they're filing a, a temporary restraining order on enforcing a certain transfer rule, right? Well, what's very interesting about this NCA ruling is it's not a ruling by the NCAA. It's a ruling to it's a ruling that it's a ruling to the NCAA. I should say, yeah, that's that's my fault. Whenever I say NCAA ruling, I thought it was implied that they don't actually do anything. So, like, but hey, uh, go ahead, Bryson. I mean, this is sort of a byproduct of them not doing anything. So, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that's like, well, isn't this the consequences of my own actions? So the so U.S. District Judge uh, a judge in West Virginia essentially uh, in gave issued a temper a temporary restraining order to the NCAA that allows multi time transfer players to immediately play upon transferring initially what the rule was is that you get one free transfer but then if you do it again then you have to sit out and then you then you have to sit out a year with right. this ruling at least with this ruling being made at least for for right now for the next two weeks there will be players that have mul transferred multiple times will be allowed to play now obviously as far as in sport action, this is go we're going we might see that something happen with basketball, but for UCF's purposes, this is going to be I think this is going to very much affect the football transfer portal. So we're, we might see sure. consequences with that. Now keep in mind now something to keep in mind here. This isn't permanent yet, permanent yet, potentially. There's going to be a hearing on the restraining order on December 27th. And the, but at the same by the same token, the the judge that issued the order wrote that essentially he he thinks that the that there is a strong likelihood of success that this that this lawsuit gets that rule nixed or cha changed, citing um citing antitrust law. So right. the the point that we're kind of making here is is that the NCAA is now reaping what it sowed. And now we're kind of talk. And now we're we're talking. Now we're kind of talking more about the immediate fallout of this and how this can affect UC, UC, UCF and college sports going forward. As I said before, maybe we could see multi-time basketball transfers see the court. UCF basketball does not have that. I think because Antoine Jones has now gotten on. Well, but and if I remember correctly, I think I saw something in there about former UCF um, and 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 Temple uh, player Jameel Reynolds. Um, actually testified in this case or at the hearing rather that he did yes i do, oh. yes i do indeed i do remember i there's, do there's another way ucf was involved but like just as for immediate players that this could impact as far as departing i mean both kobe hudson javon baker on the list here 
But remember, uh, at the end of the day, and I think Bryson, uh, you, you made this point when we were in preparation for the show here. The portal doth take it doth taketh away, but it also giveth. This also means UCF may have a wider berth of players to recruit. And with what we've seen Gus do, um, this is another double-edged sword element too. And, and you know, based on your opinion uh, that you mentioned from the judge there, now you know he certainly supports the O'Bannon ruling. I'll put it on that. Put a bow on it, Bryson. You know, this does mean that we actually could see Jameel Reynolds later this season because if this holds up, he's going to be eligible to play for Cincinnati this season. Oh my goodness! So wouldn't that wouldn't that be interesting? That's, so that's, yes, that's so, a very interesting point. Yes. So this just kind of adds a new little wrinkle into the transfer portal uh, to transfer portal discussion. You know, obviously there's going to be now players like Javon Baker and Kobe Hudson who have all uh, who have already transferred here that if they chose to go in the transfer portal, they if this order stands, which uh, it seems likely that it is, we'll see on the 27th, but at the 27th, but if the judge likes it, I'm going to defer to him on that legal opinion. Sure. Um the that that means that we could potentially see some people leave, but leave now that maybe w- wouldn't have because of these years sitting out maybe, or but but at this by the same token we could also see somebody who all, had already transferred once come to UCF now that maybe would not have other would not have otherwise. So it's still the young. This rule this was this ruling was only made. We're recording we're recording this on Wednesday morning. This this or no Thursday morning, excuse me. And this this and this order December was issued specifically, right? Yeah. Right, December 14th. This issue what this order was issued yesterday. So it's still young. We're still definitely going to be seeing the fallout of this uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks. And I'm sure, obviously, these athletes that would be in the portal still have a lot of other factors to consider besides what you know, a U.S. district judge says. Yeah. But, but the, 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 the token is, is that let's just be prepared to see, to see some more stuff in the transfer portal. And we're once again seeing this evolution in how college sports operates in this just crazy, crazy time to be, to cover the sport. But in the meantime, the rule of the portal giveth and it taketh away still applies. And mentioning Jameel Reynolds, I'm going to use that opportunity to transition to my guy, Nick Porcelli, talking some round ball there on the hardwood. Basketball men and women have both had uh, a lot of big things happen on the floor of late. Uh, I know that the lament will be the loss to Ole Miss, but Nick, you and Elo uh, had a uh, an impromptu night shift recording after that that you can find on the black and gold banner at youtube channel Bing! but with all that in my you, we got you here give us some of the highlights of what you saw in that game and what you liked about ucf and what it is they need to retool in order to compete at that level well when i uh in my article recapping the game which you can also find on black and gold banner at dot com i described the game as for ucf fans as being exciting and heartbreaking I think I need to add one more word in that, and that's also frustrating because here's the thing: they could have won that game, and it could, could have they, or should have Nick Porcelli. What could have or should have? There's a fine line. That's why I'm there's asking. a fine line, and honestly, I'm not sure because it was. I mean, let me get, let me explain why. So there were many aspects where they outplayed them especially in the second half. That second half, they were, the, in my opinion, they were the better team to Ole Miss. A, a talented, undefeated Ole Miss, might I add, who I believe is now ranked in the coaches' poll. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, 25th, I think. But, yeah, in the second, their defense clamped down on them. At the end of the game, they beat them in rebounds. And what was most impressive, you want to know how many, like, just normal baskets Ole Miss had in the second half? Six. They six, only had six. Six, six two-point field goals throughout the second half. No. F- shots total. They only made oh, six, six shots total. Six. Wow. Okay. That's that's a lot wow. of defense. It must have been a rough first half that I'm thinking. Yes. It was – well, that's the one thing. A sl- it was a sloppy game. Like, the final score was 68-70. to 70. There were a lot of missed shots, like, from both teams. It wasn't the best offensive showing. It was entertaining because mm-hmm. it was a physical defensive battle. That's why it was entertaining. But – Going back to what I was saying in the second half, obviously they scored more than points just off those six baskets. They Ole Miss was able to get to the free throw line a lot. 
and that was their strength. They were doing really well at the free throw line. But then you go to UCF, nope, 12 missed shots from the free throw line. That's a lot of points they're giving up. But the bigger issue was their three-point shooting. They only made four th- three-point shots on 22 tries. They were not shooting well, and frankly, most of, most of the team wasn't shooting well. The only one who was was Darius Johnson, and if it weren't for him, the, the shooting would be even worse. Like I said, the four, they only made four threes. Two of them were his. Most of the free throws were made by him, and mo- most of the field goals were made by him. I believe he had like 25 points. He was the game's leading scorer, mm-hmm. which, you know, when the, a few weeks ago, when they lost to Stetson, Coach Dawkins said we can't rely on Jalen Sellers. Well, tonight they needed to rely on Darius Johnson, and unfortunately, no one was really helping him out. And that includes the bench. This was the either tied for or was the lowest amount of bench points this season. With no, like, I can say it just by looking at it. I, I mean, granted, Avery had his eight points, but I mean that that's what puts it in doubt. But beyond that, yeah, this is some of the worst bench contribution we've seen all season. And I'll say this: you mentioned the four of twenty-two from three-point range. Here's to me what really hits at home, Nick. They missed twice as many three-point attempts as um, Ole Miss did. Ole Miss, you know, in their own right, sank excuse me, saying 6 of 15, which is, I mean, 40% is an excellent three-point percentage in a game. They didn't take as many. You mentioned the three throws. Uh, UCF missed 12, whereas Ole Miss only missed 10. But, yeah, I mean, that three-point stat, you got that. You got a double disparity on that uh, over and above what was going on on the boards. Now, uh, granted, UCF actually made it up on the boards. They managed to out-rebound Ole Miss. That's what I'm taking away is, is these two things and yes. tell me if you've got anything else to build. They found uh, someone else to rely on when Sellers got shot down, shut down, and they were able to compete with an SEC front court on the boards, right? Right. Um, and you bring that up. That, I think, is there are, like I said, there in the article, there are positive takeaways you can take from the game. And what you were just talking about is one of them. In the post game, we didn't just get to talk to UCF guys. This is one of the first times I've been at the Bannerette where I've gotten to talk to the other team. Uh, Ole Miss coach Chris Beard, who remember before coming to Ole Miss, he spent, I want to say, seven seasons coaching in the Big 12 for Texas Tech, who he led to a Final Four in Texas. He said, one of the first things he said actually was, this felt like a Big 12 game. And it really did. And that's big because after the game, me and Elo were saying, we think they might have just shown a blueprint of how they can compete and stay in games in the Big 12, which is to say, go crazy on defense, play physical, and they got to win the rebound battle. They showed that. Well, and- I mean, go crazy on defense is a Dawkins mantle, but the fact that they can do that with a higher caliber team is certainly encouraging. Yes. Uh, and before we wrap this up, I think we definitely need to talk about the ending. Oh, man, what an ending. Oh, my God. When I say, like I said, frustrating because they were this close. This I is. This is the, I feel like we need to start a segment on, on here on the Night Shift podcast. Nick needs a hug. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was such an, honestly, that end of the game. Taking fan like fan feelings out of it for a second, that was a really cool ending to a basketball game. If you are like a basketball, like it, a general fan of the sport, seeing well, Bryson, let, let Nick take it th- take us through it. He was there. What what did you see? Well, I know what Bryson's thinking. I'm going to talk about, but I think we need to talk about the play before that because there was a bunch. <laughs> now, you know it's it's a close game. UCF makes a basket. They either I forget how much, but they either down by two or one. They just needed to make a stop. We all think they're going to foul. They steal the ball because because they force Ole Miss to make a try to make a long pass down court. Nope. So now it's like, oh, they can run the clock down to like the last few seconds and maybe get score and take the lead. Ole Miss clamps down on them. They can't get a good shot. Shot clock violation. So now you think, ah, oh, it's over. They get it. They foul. Uh, Ole Miss, and then when Ole Miss thinks it's free throws, UCF gets the ball back, and Ole Miss makes a smart decision. Well, they wait till the, I think there was like two seconds left on the clock, and then they foul UCF. Darius Johnson goes to shoot. Now you think what they're down by three at that point, so you think, or I'm sorry, they're down by four, or no? Oh my God, I'm missing it up. Down by three. You think the plan is he's gonna Darius is gonna make the first one, 
and then potentially miss the second one and hope for a rebound. Which he pulled off last year against, I think it was Temple, by the way. Yes. But go ahead. He kind of did it, but he did it in the wrong order. He missed the first three throw. Uh oh. And then he made the and then he made the second one. So now we're thinking maybe just try to foul, maybe they steal the ball on the inbound. And he's right under the basket. He goes up to make it. Block. But then another UCF player grabs it and he puts it up and he makes it. But the ball didn't go out of his hand before the buzzer went off. Oh man. They were that close to tying it and sending into overtime. It was a two second spree of oh my god to oh my god hey listen it's moments like this it's appropriate orlando is uh the home of ucf because there's a lot of roller coasters in both ucf sports yeah. and the that's orlando what it was. that's the- what it was it's a roller coaster yeah bryson put I mean, a ball on him i mean a uh, uh, mad respect to ole miss for at that ending alan flanagan the fact that he gave the ball up but then like batted it down the way that it was like let's put it this way like they did it was not a gimme i want to put it that i i I, so losing like that is very very heartbreaking but it made for really good television let me (laughs) me, listen at the end of the day i gotta give you have to give ucf respect because i mean they kept themselves in in the game they almost gave themselves a chance to win when i thought they were done like when i was talking like you know when i went on that long rant about that ending right before that i was writing the uh final score tweet because i thought it was over i'm like all right that's it they're just gonna run the clock out wait they stole the ball delete, like delete, they delete. <laughs> they they nearly you know they gave themselves a chance when most teams couldn't and you know obviously they didn't pull it off i know people were joking about moral victories i'm not really one who likes talking about that but i mean at the same time i'm like yeah you gave yourself a shot when most teams wouldn't so a show of growth is not the same as a moral victory i i, I really wish we would stop with that yeah but- no, not I get that, obvious. but 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 you know, Coach Dawkins was saying after the game, he sensed not only you know sadness but anger in there. So like that, that's a game that the players definitely thought they wanted to win. They felt they could win. And the last time but, I in a basketball scenario like that, Coach Abe then took that women's team on to the tournament. I'll just throw yeah, that out. There. That's fair. And by the way, I also want to. I think you know I was talking about how Darius Johnson was holding up the uh, offense. I do also want to give him credit. He. He did not like throw anyone under the bus. He took responsibility himself. He said that loss is on me. I made, I turned the ball over. I missed free throw shots. Like he, he showed himself to be a team leader, and that's also something I got to show respect for. I'll tell you this: he was doing that as a freshman too. The more you sit in with Darius Johnson and you hear him talk, the more you're gonna like it. Yeah. But uh, speaking of promising things for a program, take us talk us a little bit about the women uh, in basketball. There, Bryson, uh, we're, we're talking franchise level historic stuff. Uh, that they pulled off so far and you write a little bit actually as well in the black and gold banneret um article that you put up there on black and gold banneret.com right Bing! yes so uh, after their earlier after their morning tip off against new orleans they yeah, ended up, still morning 11 a.m i yeah right exactly yeah so they had so they ended up kind of what's the word new orleans stayed in the game for the for 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 the first half but then what but then they made some halftime adjustments and then they came back out there and then just completely demolished them (laughs) so that that was certainly good to see to have some halftime adjustments some halftime adjustments get made to get a score 72 45 that yeah going against new orleans who is was one and eight so far in the season that that's a score that you kind of expect to see in a game like like that but Coach Messer, we, she started. She had a season opening winning streak last year too, if you remember, going six games. This one is now eight games and is now the longest season opening win streak in program history. So we have not seen a streak this long since the eighties, <laughs> when at least to start a season. Now, Coach Abe has led has led, led the team on a fourteen game game win streak a couple uh, very very recently. That's the longest winning streak in program history. But as far as season opening goes and getting a st- good start to the year, Coach Messer has so far, has so far done very very well at do at doing that. Um, now that's partly on her scheduling, but. Remember, I, I'm glad Elo's not here. He would have already been shouting, "Oh, but the schedule!" Right. But the thing is, <laughs> one of those wins was against Auburn, which is certainly no slouch at all, and is not 
and is as it is in the top 100 of the RPI. And I want to, by the way, mention as far as scheduling soft, we are not the only Big 12 team that's doing that. That's a point you make in the article. I think that's very cogent. Yes. Yes. So we are not the only one that's that is doing that. Like Texas Tech has a non-conference uh, strength of schedule that is only one spot better than you than UCF. So they are right in the same region in terms of non-conference scheduling difficulty. And nine of those games that Texas Tech won were against teams with an RPI of 100, 101 or worse. So, and then West Virginia, who made the NCAA tournament last year, it also has a very bad strength of schedule. Two, uh, 301, three, uh, three, 300, 301, better than Texas Tech and UCF, but certainly not too much of an improvement. And eight of their wins came against teams that are 101 or, or 101 or worse. Now, each, and the, Another thing that they have in common with UCF is that each of their top 100 RPI teams that they played, that one game they did have, they won. Which is and that and also for UCF's case against Auburn shows a contrast from last year. They because last year Auburn took them to the woodshed. So <laughs> th- this so this so this time I'm really seeing some improvement out of I think a Satya Messers unit, which you know sure. this is year two. You know she has a lot more experience in this and this reminds me of the volleyball opportunity to put to put some food back in the pantry like let's call that what it is too yeah. oh yes exactly and um let's also not forget that uh, that i think part of this is because of the players that coach messer went out and uh, went out and got i mean caitlin peterson and hla cut have been absolutely phenomenal in, in, Kelly, in, all of them yeah yes, exactly and uh, exactly and then jay the layla jewett like this is the best that was the best I've seen her, and I've seen her do some really good stuff last season. But I feel like that she is like really going on all cylinders. I haven't and really then- seen this much national recognition. <clears throat> excuse me, national rec- oh, recognition for a player since Diamond Battles, right? Like you, it, what she's doing from the three point line. Well, it was the second best percentage it in the is, nation, right? It is the second best three point percentage in the nation right now. Fifty nine. Point three percent. You are correct about that. Now, with that said, there are player other players that have more free throws. Let's like someone like third place behind her is a BYU player with fifty one attempts. With wow, but the thing I think that shows about Layla is that she's really good at picking your shot and knowing oh, she can yeah. say. Well, and, and this team has a good chemistry in the backcourt. I, I think you allude to that plenty as well um you know we've talked about maya burns in the past and her factor uh with all of that um but yeah so with all that in mind lots of basketball for bryson here coming up on monday um that's uh when the women play again at uh two o'clock and they will be battling uh fau and then main of course that night for the men so uh, hey, uh reason go ahead Reasonable tip-off time. That's a, the, a little more re- with the team. Yeah, 2 p.m. for the women and 7 p.m. for the men. Yeah, so uh, you, you don't have to worry about lunch, I guess. Uh, yeah, only two more, only two more chances for the women before they go up. Before they then go up against that Big Twelve, Big Twelve gauntlet. So these two games, I think they're definitely going to be crucial to get your ducks in a row and just get yourself all, all firing on all cylinders before then you get the the gauntlet you know the yeah. basically the gauntlet for the rest of the season kind of like volleyball the difference being though is that coach messer had a year before had a year to kind of learn her learn, learn her unit so i'm i'm very interested to see what was to see what coach master can pull off honestly well I, I and i think volleyball still had some role players where i mean losing mccain and melville up is a big deal but uh, i digress yeah anyways two more games uh out of conference for the women three for the men and bryson will be on top of it all on monday to handle all that yes because finals are over yay (laughs) (laughs) congratulations to you both on that by the way um but let's jump over here Uh, a couple things we want to wrap up with before we uh finish things off here on the night shift a couple of um headline things here first of all uh anthony montalvo uh has been according to the uh Orlando Predators Twitter Twitter account is looking to suit up for them. I believe they have tryouts this month, so there's a chance, kind of like Dylan Barnes did after he finished his career, um, former UCF kicker, uh, spent a little time playing for the Preds 
Anthony Montalvo looks like he's going to be joining up with them. We'll see how that goes as things go on. And in volleyball, we have a draftee, right, Bryson? Yes. So in the in the new Pro Volleyball Federation, which we've actually talked about before on this show, because former UCF volleyball coach Todd Dajneg is the head coach of the Atlanta franchise in that league. Former UCF volleyball player Abby Hansen was drafted in that team's college draft, which took place which took place recently. She was selected by the by the Omaha Supernovas, but thanks to a trade. She is now on the hometown Orlando Valkyries, who are going to be playing out of the addition financial or uh, financial arena. So, so Abby Hansen will help. Awesome. These team names are awesome, by the way. They are, by the way. Yeah. I was about to say Abby Hansen will be here in Orlando helping the flight of the Valkyries. I like the sound of all of that. And, um, of, and of course, so- you know, and of course, you know what her you know what her first game is gonna be in addition financial arena against Atlanta. It's against Atlanta. <laughs> so Abby Hansen, Abby Hansen versus Todd Dagenet to start off the PVF in or PVF in Orlando. So right there on campus too, like you mentioned, that should be that should be a fun watch for you volleyball fans there, one hundred percent. And then we'll head over. I I would call it jokingly stickball, but the Sultan is not here. But yeah, D one baseball report comes out uh, surrounding UCF baseball, and it looks like. We're getting a little bit more uh, ironclad uh, news towards the the concept that uh, John Rice Plumley will not be a dual sport athlete this year, whether it's because he's trying to prepare for the NFL draft or whether it's, you know, due to whatever limitations he's getting from the current coaching uh, uh, administration, shall we say, is a, is a whole other question. Obviously, there's no official word yet, but um, I think it's safe to say that this report is um, – something that's making that look a little less likely to happen. Uh, guys, quickly, I mean, what kind of an impact would uh, no JRP mean for this team? Well, well, we could talk about the talent. I mean, in my m- mind, he was a great player, a player that's capable of getting drafted to the MLB. But I think one thing that I don't think a lot of people are talking about is marketing. I mean, having him on the team alone, that sold a lot of tickets because people wanted to see him play because, you know, we all saw him play football. How great is he going to do in baseball? Now he's not there. Well, Maybe that will make people lose interest. I think I think that this is interesting because with D1 baseball, this is the first time that I think we've seen a seen a source a, a source like official like everyone can see that is that is now said that there is that po- that possibility that it's not going to happen because remember John Rice Plumley addressed this not too long ago and he said that he's gonna you know think it oh, think it over and that think it over and that kind of stuff. So Barry non-committal a non-committal this one though is talking about how baseball is very is the baseball team is hopeful that he is going to do that even saying uh there one there's one quote in the in the tweet that promoted the article i don't see how he's not an mlb draft pick if he plays baseball this season and has another big year so the talent is there so it's, i think it's going to be a matter of you know what decision he a decision he makes, but this is definitely one that sh- that I think I feel like the language of hopeful in that there it seems like maybe there's a lean toward football, maybe not much, but I think the, that 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 potential is very much there. Now, understandably, looking at the UCF baseball team, their outfield is very crowded, which so it makes sense that because obviously JRP would have a lot of competition to contend with, but. Yeah, I think I think it would certainly be a loss, even even with that even with that happening. I think the guy wants to play baseball, but you know, we'll see what happens. I'm I'm sure following the guest brewable, someone's going to ask him that question. So we'll see if that response changes. I, and yeah, I don't think it will either. By the way, as a quick side note, I think his prospects of actually being a pro athlete are much better as a baseball player than as a football player. But that's well, we'll leave all of that. All I can tell you is about having the talent. We have it all right here on this edition of Night Shift. Um, So for Nick Porcelli and my guy Bryson Turner, find Nick Porcelli on Twitter at Nick Porcelli2. Find Bryson Turner at It's Bryson Turner on Twitter. Uh, Of course, I'm Kyle Nash, the student of the game. You can find me on Twitter at the SOTG and follow uh, the Black and Gold Banneret on all of their socials as 
as uh, we deliver those goods at UCF Banner at underscore SPN and Breed Bryson's article. He's got a lot of cool stuff to talk about in that. Watch Nick Porcelli's wrap of, of the Ole Miss game uh, for men's basketball as well. Black and gold, Banneret.com YouTube channel. Um, you don't, we don't bring this part. It's the marketeering part it's the, where we advertise. Well, it's if we're going to market, then let me say this. Make sure you guys follow Kyle on Twitter so you can keep up with what's going on with the Cure Bowl. That's right. Covering it. I will be at FBC Mortgage Stadium on Saturday uh, covering the Miami Red Hawks and the Appalachian State uh Miami of Ohio Red Hawks let's let's be clear uh, against the Appalachian State Mountaineers some quality G5 football action there as well um so and next until next time everybody hopefully uh Jeff will be back in, in the saddle to handle his business there but until next time everyone class dismissed